Good evening, everybody. It's great to see you here. I'm thrilled to have you here in person. And I know there are many of you listening online. So that's wonderful. Thank you for coming to this event. Uh, the League is a nonpartisan organization. I'm going to st start with that statement. We do not support or oppose candidates for office or political parties. However, we do take positions on issues in the public interest after careful thought and discussion. So I'm going to just pause here and talk about the positions that the League has related to education. We support the implementation of non-discriminatory policies, dispersal of equitable state aid, and retaining program and personnel responsibilities in the local district to support educational equity. Our panelists today will discuss the importance of protecting and adequately funding public, public education. We are very privileged to have Julie Underwood here as our moderator. Julie is an active WEED member and Dean Emerita of the UW School of Education. I'm gonna pause and say that uh, the program team is led by Sue Jenick standing in the back there, who does a fabulous job. And she was assisted for this forum with a team and team, wait, raise your hands, Amanda Krieger, Eileen Nettleton, Janine Ramsey, Louise Robbins, and Julie Underwood. Our operations manager, Carrie Helmer, and volunteers, Cindy Lindquist and Brooke Solvet provided publicity and communication support. We thank you all for your contributions to make this possible. Uh, I, I wanna just pause and say that on November 7th, we're having another hybrid forum that we're very excited about. This is going to be co-sponsored with the Urban League of Greater Madison, and it's gonna happen right next door at the Urban League. And it's called Why Voting Matters, Consequences for Childcare and Diversity in Education. So keep an eye out for the communications that will come out about that forum. I am now going to introduce League member Louise Robbins, who will present the land acknowledgement. Slowly but surely. Bonjour, Anin, that's Ojibwe, or hello. In owning our past and charting our future, we, the League of Women Voters of Dane County, recognize the indigenous peoples who are the original stewards of the lands on which we now live. While we struggle to learn more about the current and ongoing context of colonialism, League formation began more than a century ago in 1920 with women's suffrage, but nearly two centuries ago, even prior to the 1848 creation of the state of Wisconsin, an 1832 treaty forced the Ho-Chunk to cede their territory of Tijope, Four Lakes. Both the federal and state governments repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. We continue this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. In Dane County, we are all standing on the stolen ancestral lands of the Ho-Chunk people. We pay respect to their elders past, present, and future. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together today. League of Women Voters of Dane County is grateful for the past, present, and future guidance of Wisconsin's Native Nations. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, Louise. Um, my name is Julie Underwood, as I've been introduced, and um, I want to thank you all for being here tonight. I want 
certainly want to thank the league for um, the Dane County League for putting this uh, event together, uh, because of course, to us and to many of you, um, preserving public education is a an incredibly important thing. So I'm glad that um, you're willing to have the com I'm glad you're willing to have the conversation. Thank you very much for the cue there. Got it. Um, and tonight's program is being recorded. And uh, I want to say hello to everybody who's online as well. Um, also, I want to thank the committee that's already been introduced um, for putting together the resource materials. And I'm sure you, you may have had a chance to look at them. A great job of putting together resource materials, which are always greatly appreciated. Um, the, our title is Preserving Public Education, and you might notice that there are only two of us here rather than the three of us. Unfortunately, our colleague Kevin Henry has had a family emergency and was not at the very last minute and was um, not able to be here to be with us tonight. So um, we're going to go on. He so sends his he sends his he sends his best and he sends his apologies as well. Um, but you just have the two Julies, so <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> so um, in terms of procedure and how we're going to do this, uh, the plan was that we were going to do a very very short introductions to topics um, to the topic at hand, which is public schools, particularly school financing and um, and the, one of the greatest threats, which would be school vouchers. And we are glad to engage in conversation and questions as we, after we're done with that very short introduction. There are note cards that those of you who are in the room um, have note cards. And if you would like to put down any comments or questions that you might have for our discussion. If you would put them on the note card and we're gonna hail them up like, okay, I, I promise if you raise your hand with a note card, it won't be a bid. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not a live auction, you'll be all right. And um, people come around and pick them up and kind of sort through them a bit to give some, to, some line of thought, right, mm -hmm. to our organization to, to questions. And for those of you who are online, if you, if you could please, as we're all used to doing this, put your questions and comments in the chat and they're going to be reviewed as well, right? Got it? Did I do it right? Did it right, great. So um, this is, Preserving preserving public education, um, also our our professional lives, yes. right? <laughs> and we've been doing this together for a long time. Um, I want to introduce my colleague Julie Mead, uh, and Julie and I have been working together for many many year, years um, because Julie was one of my first doctoral students at UW Madison in the School of Education. And people have always gotten us confused because we do a lot of things together and both of our names are Julie, um, but it's a great tag team that we've had for a long time. Quite proud of Julie Mead. She um, has, is, we're both now retired and um, she's had many honors um, across her, her professional career including right now she is the president of the Education Law Association, which is our well, immediate past president. Oh, okay. But yes. Okay. I'm still on I'm the gonna, board. I was going to keep you in business. No, there. that's no? okay. Right. <laughs> uh, which is our organization for those people who are interested in education law and policy across the United States. Yes. Um, and we both are on... Um, league education committees and and legislative committee with in terms of education issues so uh let's see let's talk about public schools and if you didn't know that public schools were in dire straits or if you saw the cap times uh this week where it said dire 
dire education, right, as opposed to higher education. When I saw that, I thought, well, you know, it's dire for K-12 schools or PK-12 schools as well. Lots of things have happened um, over the last 20 years um, that have impacted public schools negatively. For instance, the culture wars are, are actually fought out in our public schools and in our public libraries. This is Banned Book Week. And we're seeing those wars within our public schools in terms of curriculum, issues of censorship, and um, the widening of the of gaps, racial gaps, economic gaps continues in our country. And certainly we see that played out in public schools. Children's needs are increasing, really, we can see this in the state of Wisconsin. We can see this in Dane County. It's not just someplace else. Children are becoming, are living, more and more children are living in poverty, which impacts education as well. And if that weren't enough, politics in general is being played out in terms of public policy with public schools. And when we work in public, in public schools and our advocates for public schools, you know, it's not our fault that partisan politics is being played out there, but it is our problem. And we have to deal with it every day. School boards across the state of Wisconsin have to deal with this every day. And the legislature deals with it every day and quite often in a way that, in my opinion, um, plays children as pawns to politics. Finances in the state of Wisconsin, um, we are <laughs> probably last in the nation in terms of increase of funds um, since the, the Great Recession. Um, we have not kept up with any kind of increase in inflation for nearly two decades. So if you can imagine running a business where you have not had an inflationary increase for 20 years and where your all of your costs were increasing and all of the needs of the people that you were working with were increasing, that's what we have. I suppose that I could add to that the grand exodus of teachers um, that happened in around 2010. Um, during act right after Act Ten, where we lost lots and lots of teachers, um, that's that 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 adds to this. I mean, I can't even tell you which one of these things is worse. And I apologize for being um, really a downer. Am I a Debbie Downer? I am really a Debbie Downer. I, not a it's not a cheerful story. So. That's kind of where we are in terms of public schools in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we have these spending caps that were put in place in a long time ago, um, and they put pressure on school districts since you can't spend, they call them, they call them revenue caps, but they're actually spending caps. And so you can't spend any more than that. And even if the state gives additional funds, as if they're going to, but even when they do give us additional funds, if those spending caps are not increased, a school district can't spend any more money for a child. And every, every district has a different spending cap based on what their spending was in 1973. Um, so 94, okay, I was exaggerating. I know she keeps me honest. <laughs> So, so you, you've got these incredible constraints, just incredible constraints to run a school district. In addition, in the state of Wisconsin, we haven't had you know, an inflationary increase. And yet at the same time, the legislature has chosen to fund a parallel system of schools by sending public money to private schools 
um, through our voucher programs and through our independent charter programs as well. Both of them do this. And we, we could talk about the difference between independent charters and school district charters. Huge difference, one's public, one's private. Um, but we've continued to spend more and more money on, on, on private schools. So we're running this parallel system where the, the spending in the, in the private system has increased greatly, where we've kind of flatlined in the public system. As a matter of fact, in the last budget that was just signed, where the headlines were that we got a billion dollars for education, let me tell you, a lot of that went to, to the um, private schools. As a matter of fact, the private schools got a huge increase in the vouchers, in the vouchers and the charter payments, as opposed to a very, very small increase in revenue limits, the spending limits. That's all we got was we got an increase in spending limits. We didn't get additional money from the state to use to, to, in, to sp spend that money, but we did get a small increase in spending, in our spending limits. And of course, the piece that went all over the United States, we got that little increase every year for 400 years. Now in 400 years, we may be back to Bitcoins, right? And that little, uh, you know, like a little increase every year, the same increase every year, I imagine $300 400 years from now is not going to be as valuable as three as $300 today. But we did get that. And we're grateful for that. Kind of, but it doesn't, it's, that's not very, it doesn't sound very grateful. Sorry. Um, but the, but the private schools got a huge increase. So um, that's kind of like kicking somebody when they're down. Um, so that's what we want to talk about tonight. Uh, Julie Mead does a, an incredible amount of work with vouchers and we want to start there although we're welcome to entertain questions and have conversations more broadly um, to just get us into the right mode i want to point out that school vouchers are not new and you it's important to me at least for you it's important to us okay. at least for you to think about their historic roots and their context. Vouchers started as a reaction to Brown versus the Board of Education, where schools were being desegregated. And in the south in southern states, I'll say that that way, in the southern states, um, rather than integrating their system, a number of them closed their system and gave vouchers to students to go to private school where the, the private schools weren't, didn't have to integrate. And that's how they started. It wasn't just a Milton Friedman thing, an economic or you know, some kind of um, economic uh, competitive idea. It started in racism and it started as an anti-discrimination, uh, uh, anti integration measure. And that's, so anytime we talk about vouchers and, and independent charters, we need to think about those roots um, because they continue to taint today, even today. Um, jumping ahead, you know, Wisconsin has the great uh, privilege of being the home of modern vouchers. Correct. Um, when Tommy Thompson came back from an ALEC meeting and brought a, you know, a, you know, this a plan for a voucher program, which was implemented in Milwaukee. And, it, you know, it, that was a small experimental plan that was based on, um, and it was income based. Um, and we started, uh, there we started. Yeah. Very limited, though. Very, very limited in terms of the number of students. And you had, you know, the poverty level had to be high. And 
175% of the federal poverty line, 1% of the student body. Oh, sorry. 175% of the poverty line was the, was the original Milwaukee Parental Choice Program. 1% of the students who were in Milwaukee, no more than 1%. Uh, voucher was $2,500. The both the children and the schools had to be within the physical boundaries of the city of Milwaukee. Um, and uh, no school could enroll more than 49% of its uh, student body population by means of a voucher. That's, that's how it started. That's how it started. Take it away. Tell that's me. not where we are. Yeah. <laughs> so... And I will just mention, you know, in terms of Julie's history, we, uh, you know, the first vouchers were as a, a way to challenge desegregation and to evade desegregation. It took the Supreme Court um, of the United States to say that that was not an appropriate way for um, those states to um, deal with the order to desegregate, and so that stopped. And then we later had a, a another Supreme Court case that we thought settled the question, um, that said that you couldn't send uh, private money to religious schools. But that all changed um, in the '90s. So uh, when the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program started in 1990, it was also one other limitation was it had to be non-sectarian schools. So the first big expansion was in 1996 when um, it the program expanded to include religious schools within the city of Milwaukee. At that time, they also um, took off the limitations of the number of kids that could participate. And not surprisingly, both the original program and the expansion were challenged in our state Supreme Court. So first in a case called Davis versus Grover, which this Julie litigated, so she can tell you more about that if you'd like. Uh, <clears throat> the Wisconsin Supreme Court there, based on the fact that it was small and the legislature used the term experimental. And at that time, to be fair, all of the ideas around vouchers were theoretical. Would it work? Would this notion of opening up the educational marketplace and allowing parents to place their children where they want, would that work? Would that simple shift in governance result in better outcomes for kids? So on that basis, the Supreme Court said, well, there is no allegation that the, Supreme, that the legislature is neglecting its obligations to public schools. So it seems to us that this is something extra. This is discretionary, something that they can do in addition to what they're obligated to do by the state constitution. And so on that basis, they upheld it. When it was challenged again after the expansion, then the challenge was, is, is it proper to give public monies to religious schools um, for the purposes of education? And there the thinking was, first in our state Supreme Court um, in 1998, and then in the United States Supreme Court in another case that came out of Ohio on virtually, not exactly, but virtually the same facts. Um, and in both of those cases, the thinking was that it didn't violate the um, constitutional requirement uh, of a separation of church and state or the establishment clause. It did not violate the establishment clause because the decision maker was the parent, that the parent got to decide where the money went, not the state. Now, as you can imagine, at the U.S. Supreme Court, that was a five to four decision. And the, you know, the dissenting justice was like, what? What are you talking about? But that was the thinking that because the parent decides where the child goes and therefore where the money goes. And because that's not a governmental agent making that decision, you don't have to worry about the establishment clause. So with that, you know, first opening by our state Supreme Court, and then of course the federal Supreme Court, you saw the voucher program in Milwaukee grow by leaps and bounds. A lot of you might not know this, but there are um, a number of schools in Milwaukee that are 100% voucher enrolled. 
meaning that it's a private school, but all of the children who attend there attend there with public money. None of them attend by virtue of either parents paying the tuition or some other kind of scholarship that may have predated the vouchers. You also saw um, the advent of a whole lot of schools, both large and small, starting that never existed before. So with this opportunity to have money and a steady stream of money, you had a, a whole host of schools that opened that have never opened before. You also had a lot of them that opened and then closed. So that happened. Um, now the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program has uh, the, the children still must live within the geographic boundaries of the city of Milwaukee to be eligible under the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program. The schools can be anywhere, though, anywhere in the state. The parents simply have to pay for the child to get there if they're outside of the city of Milwaukee. Um, there are no limits into the number of children that can attend, no, no limits on the number of um, children a school can enroll, um, and the voucher amount has increased quite a bit. I'll, I'll give you the real numbers in just a minute, but that, so that expansion happened, and then in 2011, at the same time that the state legislature made a huge, drastic, some might even say draconian cut to public education, including um, making a change in the law such that uh, prior to 2011, as expenses um, increased, the revenue limits were tethered or, or, or connected to the consumer price index. So if the amount of you know, it took to heat the buildings went up, and then you automatically got to levy more taxes and spend more because of the consumer price index. They took that tether away in 2011 and cut, drastically cut the amount of money that went to public schools. At the same time, they introduced a new voucher program. And that voucher program is the Racine Parental uh, Choice Program. Both Racine and Milwaukee um, do have income limits. It's 300% of the federal poverty limit for the first year that a child enrolls. So if a child meets that um, requirement, that income requirement, and their family's fortunes increase after year one, the child continues in the voucher program with public money even if the, their parents are now making more money. Um, so the Racine program began in 2011. Two years later, the uh, legislature adopted the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program, which is the statewide program. Initially, it started, it will sound familiar, with 1%, no more than 1% of a single district could use a voucher with an increasing each year. We're now up to 8%. Two years, it'll be 10%. And then there will be no limit after that. Um, after that, the all the caps will come off. So that's the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program. It has a slightly different uh, income eligibility. It's 220% of the federal uh, poverty level. Then in 2015, we added our fourth voucher program, the Special Needs Scholarship Program. It has no income limits. It's uh, to permit a child with a disability who has been identified by their local sc school district as having a disability under the Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Act to attend a private school at the parent's choosing. That private school, though, interestingly enough, does not have to implement the plan. The parents have to agree. So the parents and the school agree what is going to happen with the child. But the, the school gets the money whether or not they provide any special education services or not. The parents have to approve it, but that's what happens. So um, these programs have grown. Um, with last year's enrollment figures, if the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program was a school district, it would be the second largest school district in the state. So it's past Madison, it's past 
Green Bay, you know, Eau Claire, all of our you know, Kenosha Racine, all of our larger school districts. Um, it enrolled last year nearly 29,000 students, just a little under 29,000 students. Um, the Racine program enrolled a little under uh, 4,000 students. The Milwaukee, or, excuse me, the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program, the statewide program, enrolled 17,000. And then the Special Needs Scholarship Program enrolled about 2,200 kids. So all together, those programs cost us last year $402 million, $61,400. Um, that's probably an underestimate because the amount for the special needs scholarship program, um, those that number is, is really an estimate from the Department of Public Instruction as opposed to the exact number. Um, Yes, yes, that's just Julie saying, say that's annually. That's yes, that's one year. That that's how much we spent one year on private education at public expense. But it's gonna cost us a whole lot more this year because the the amount of the vouchers got a double digit percentage increase, and not a tiny increase, a, a huge increase. So this year for a child attending a K-8 school in uh, the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program, the Racine Parental Choice Program, or the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program, they're guaranteed a voucher of 9,000, or their school is, $9,893. I should also mention that these vouchers bear no relationship to the amount of that tuition is. So if they, are still charging people tuition at this private school, their tuition level may be well under this. Could be over it too, but it could be under this amount. So they do agree to take this voucher in full satisfaction of tuition, whatever the tuition is. So 9,893 per student in K-8, $12,387 per student in uh, grades nine through 12. And the special needs scholarship program is $15,065, um, but up to $19,466 if um, some other costs are um, shown. So um, that number, $402 million, is going to go up. It was going to go up anyway because we're going to see an, a 1% in increase in the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program, but it's also going to go up <laughs> significantly because of the huge increase in vouchers that occurred. One final thing to mention, um, Julie already mentioned the revenue caps. They haven't uh, published the figures for the revenue caps for this school year yet, but last year, the Legislative Fiscal Bureau said that the average revenue limit was 11000 888. That was the average in our 424 school districts, which means that there's a significant number of school districts with revenue caps well below that number, some with above, but a significant number below, um, which means that for the first time, we're going to have a rather substantial number of school districts who are going to have revenue limits less than the voucher amounts for the high school voucher, um, which is a, a little bit scary when you start talking about um, how how all of this is going to work and what it what is all going to mean for our public schools. The way this money is is um, collected is that the amount not for the Milwaukee program. The Milwaukee program is funded a slightly different way, but for the state program and the RACIB program, what happens is that the, the voucher amount is deducted from the state aid that the district would receive. So the, the district is allowed to count the students who, are, who live in their district who are exercising vouchers as part of what's called their membership, but that money has to go um, out. So they it's subtracted from the the state aid that the school district would otherwise receive. Um, that's kind of our quick down and dirty. Um,
as the state um, is calculating this, with the increases in the tuition rates, mm -hmm. there are some school districts where their voucher payment will be as much as what they would have gotten in the equalization formula. And so they won't be getting that, that part of their state aid at all. So <laughs> The, the vouchers are statewide. The question was, is there a district that doesn't have vouchers? Well, um, actually, I had a student several years ago who took a look at that, and there was no school district that did not have a private school participating in the voucher program within 25 miles, which means that Yes, it could happen. Now, the thing that I'm concerned about, as I mentioned as part of the Milwaukee story, the large number of schools that we saw that opened that did not exist before, some religious, some not religious. Um, and I'm very concerned that once the caps come off, so right, you know, right now, this year, no single district um, can have more than 8% of its total membership of kids exercising vouchers. And so if more than 8% want to, to exercise a voucher, um, those extras are put on a, a waiting list. And, and then next year it'll go up to 9% and then it'll go up to 10%, but then the lid's gonna come off. And I should mention that there's no requirement that these kids are what we call sector switchers. You know, somebody who's enrolled in a public school who, for whatever reason, is is dissatisfied with their public school and then goes looking for a private school. Um, the the data that we have, our data about the Milwaukee, the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program is is better because they started tracking this right away. But you'll see that the majority of the people who are exercising vouchers for the first time in any given year are people who ne are children who never were enrolled in public ed. They were always enrolled in either they were being homeschooled or they're enrolled in um, private education. So what we're really, what we really committed to or what our state legislature has committed us to is funding two separate systems of education. One that is controlled by public, the public school boards, and a whole host of uh, laws and standards required to keep those schools accountable. And then a second set of, of um, schools, the private schools, who aren't held to the same standards, either in terms of the children that they have to serve, or um, even the requirements to not discriminate. Um, all of those are, 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 a little, are different. So there we have it. Yeah. Um, and I would encourage people, Amanda, have you have you gotten some? <clears throat> You've got online questions. So do you want to how about you ask us those online questions? Start with one. What's uh, Oh, yeah. Here, I'll, I'll... Yes. Well, here you. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> okay, let's start with this one. Um, thank you, Janine. The first question I have a whole list of them, so sorry for the dead air, but um, the question. I'm choosing first is, have the voters of Wisconsin approved voucher programs? This is this is a rigged question because we know the answer to this one. Janine knows the answer to this one. No, <laughs> it's an easy answer. No, in fact, the um, each of the programs that we have now um, was enacted by means of either a budget bill or another sort of omnibus bill, meaning it was one bill with a whole bunch of stuff in it. So obviously if it's in a budget bill, you know, the, the 
person who represents me in the state legislature, they're people, so right, in this, both the Senate and the Assembly, those who represent me get one vote, one vote each, but that one vote covers schools and roads and all a whole host of things, um, prisons, parks, everything the state government does. So it um, it makes it both difficult for someone to vote against the state budget, um, but it also makes it easier to um, not be sorry, not be held accountable. Um, because somebody can say, well, I, you know, I really don't like that program, but I had to vote for the budget, right? So you, you hear both of those kinds of things happen. So I'm going to scatter through some of these other ones. Okay. Um, and that, I'll do that one. you want to do this one? Sure. Okay. So here, I'll read it to you. Um, does, does, Dawn does not think that attacking special needs vouchers is an answer. Some special needs children are not adequately served in the public schools at this time. Um, focus should be on raising the revenue caps for public schools and majorly increasing money for the public school system. That's true. I would agree with that. I, However, you already have a system under federal law that if a if a parent of a child with a disability in a public school believes that their child is not getting what the law calls a free appropriate public education, which is what they're entitled to, so it's a federal entitlement, a very important federal entitlement, if they are not receiving that and they um, go to their school district and say, you know, you need to do better and the school district doesn't do better, and the parent believes that in order to get the child an appropriate education, they have to enroll their child in a private school, the federal law already has a mechanism for the parents to recover those funds. Um, but what they have to prove first is that what the district offered was substandard and what the private school they selected was as actually providing that which the public school denied. What the special needs scholarship program does is it takes all of that away. So it doesn't matter whether the school is has been serving the child well or not. It doesn't matter if the school selected by the private school selected by the parents is serving the child well or not. The only thing that happens and it, it you know that so that that system is it gives you an end around that entire system. So my concern is is not an and if it if I came across as attacking special needs scholarship programs, I apologize. I'm not attacking the program. My biggest concern is that those programs don't have adequate enough protections for the very kids that we're talking about. Because when they move into that system, they have to waive their right, essentially waive their right to a free appropriate public education, and they may not be getting um what they're entitled to and whether or not the parent fully understands that, you know, that's really, really complicated. And my concern is that the kids aren't going to be well served. And in fact, are going to have their rights diminished without their parents knowing that that's what's happening. I love this. I just keep, I can just keep asking you questions. <laughs> well, maybe I, I'll say you answer that one. I've not had this chance before. Yes, you have. Oh, yeah. She told you I was her student. She's had this chance many, many times. Doctoral dissertation many, defense. Many times you've had this chance. So I'm gonna, I've am i got That's some stacks. She's a dean. Oh, don't let her get, no. She can't get away with that one. Um, so we have uh, some really good questions about academic outcomes. So we have some okay. really good questions about, about accountability. All righty. But this one kind of stands alone. Okay. So. Um, is it correct that the private schools that accept vouchers do not have to accept any child who wants to attend? Okay, let me let me. You have let to me formulate. Have I'll to formulate. Dun 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 dun. dun. <laughs> yes and no. Let's let. How's that for a wiggle worm kind of answer? So let me explain what I mean. So the child that the the school 
has to accept any child that um, whose needs can be met with the, the with minor modifications for the services they already provide. If the child, either by virtue of a need to learn English because English isn't their first language or a child who has a disability who requires special education, if the school does not have that program already, they can turn that child away and they don't have to accept that child. Otherwise, if they have space available, they're supposed to accept any child they are not permitted to require that child to, to participate in religious activities here in the state of Wisconsin. Um, uh, let's see. And if they have more applicants than they have space available, they're supposed to use some kind of random uh, um, system to select which children get to attend and which do not. But... <clears throat> Well, so there's a, you know, so those are the things. So the, the, so my colleague, um, Suzanne Eckes and I um, actually wrote a paper several years ago where we, we tried to explain why these systems, what we, our title was it opens the door to discrimination. And the reason that it does that is because the rules, well, there's a couple of things. So first, what constitutes discrimination in a public school is not the same as what constitutes discrimination in a private school as a legal matter. So even a school that's doing that, you know, they'd say, but I'm not breaking any, you know, we're not breaking any laws. And they may well be right because the definitions are different. The second thing, although because our program is one of the oldest in the country, frankly, our program does a little bit better than many of the other programs around the country. State legislatures really have not made non-discrimination a, condi a condition of participation in the program by the private schools. Um, so that's a second reason. And then the third reason is the one that I alluded to is that because the schools get to control what programs they offer and what they don't offer, that allows them to control who's there because as I mentioned before they can say I'm sorry we can't serve your child here and because that's not doesn't constitute discrimination in a private school they're permitted to do that likewise um, you know kids in public schools have constitutional rights that's kind of a shocker for many but they do um, you we can argue about how robust those rights are these days but they do have at least um, some constitutional rights. Um, that's not true in uh, private schools. <laughs> that sounds funny. I, I'm not trying to make a joke. It's because the Constitution requires what we call a state actor. And a private school is not a state actor. So, for example, when a child is facing uh, expulsion, there are due process requirements in a public school that have to be met for a child to be properly, ex you know, to be expelled in a lawful manner. Um, my personal opinion is we use that penalty way too often, and I, I'm not a big proponent of it in public schools either, but um, none of that is required in a private school. So a private school who thinks that a child's behavior is not meeting their norms can ask that child to leave, and there's no requirement that they follow any kind of due process at all. So, um, yeah, <laughs> so there, there's a lot more um, ability for the private school to control what student body population they serve as opposed to a public school, which is expected to serve the entire public, not just the parts of the public they elect to serve. At which we proudly do. Um, I'm going to ask you to do these two while I answer this one, okay? So, oh, see, I'm, I'm helping. <laughs> you, you are always helpful. Okay, so, so, so someone asked, does, the, does that mean that the authorization of voucher schools is not in the Wisconsin? No, no. When, when Julie said that, that these came in through the budget bill, they came into the budget bill but the statutes were written as part of those budget bills. And so right. all four of these programs are written into the education statutes uh, in the state of Wisconsin. 
and then the DPI has written regulations for them. So it's not a rogue program at no, all. No. It's just the the way in which it was passed by the legislature is, we, we is so that there was never an independent vote on voucher programs. Yeah. Yeah, never an up or down vote on yeah. on that. Never that an up or down point. vote on on vouchers. <clears throat> so so do voucher schools uh, have to meet educational standards? Yes, but not the same standards that public schools do. So in this in the standards, there's a requirement. So to be a private school in the state of Wisconsin, to, to even whether you take a voucher or not, there are, are some standards. So, you know, you have to teach reading, you have to teach arithmetic, you have to teach. Um, I think civics is in there too, isn't it? Um, and you have to teach some version of science. Now, what's in any of those things is up to the people, but you have to have there and you have to have a certain number of hours of instruction um, and uh, you have to help meet health and safety requirements. Um, that's, that's about it. So in the vow to be el an eligible private school in the voucher program, you have to meet those standards. You also have to be willing to uh, submit uh, to an, an annual audit. You have to, um, I'm, I'm forgetting something, uh, submit to an annual audit. You have to offer your students the statewide test, but the kids don't have to take them if the parents don't want them to, but you have to offer them the statewide tests. Um, so something went, went in and flitted right back out the other ear. I'm, I'm trying to think. There's um, health and safety, the audits, the, oh, well, that, yeah, the health and safety standards. Oh, and then I was just going to say this, the, the schools themselves get to determine annually whether they participate or not. So they no no private schools required to participate. They decide whether to participate and to what extent. So they determine how many seats, that's the way we usually talk about it, how many seats there are available for kids by virtue of the vouchers. So the the schools um, do that and then the let's see any other am I leaving out any standards? Um, annual audit Yeah. Oh, oh, th th here's the one. Here's the one that flitted out. Now, um, all of the teachers, this was not true when it first started, but now it is true that all of the teachers have to have college degrees. And so do the administrators. They don't have to have degrees. They don't have to be certified teachers or certified administrators, but they have to have a college degree and a teacher's aide has to have a high school diploma. Do you want to do re oh wait um the other one was about about accountability as well well this one's an interesting little story because oh you know the original program had an evaluation component which made sense because it was uh, an experiment experimental um but then that went away uh, in part some theorized that it went away because when they expanded it to religious schools, they were trying to make sure that they could get by the, the test that they thought that the Supreme Court was going to apply to them. So they took that away. Then shortly thereafter, they added the evaluation. Once it, once it was approved, they added the evaluation component back in, but that evaluation was done in the mid-2000s. Um, and so now there is no evaluation component that's active anymore. So um, they're accountable in those ways. The primary means of accountability is the parents. So what we've done is we've shifted from collective accountability to individual parental accountability. Um, so the onus is on the parents to decide whether or not this school is sufficient. That, and the onus is not on us collectively to say that's not good enough for our kids. This is a, there's another group of questions where I'm trying to put them together, right? So if you don't hear your question, it's because I, it's an amalgam. Um, these are all about academic outcomes and evaluation of outcomes for students. And here's one as well. Um, so all, all three of those, can you look at those <laughs> or four, one, two, three, four. And if you look okay. at those, rather than me reading all four of those, I'm going to answer this one. Go for it. Gets, like, I'll take a look at this. Four, I get one. 
<laughs> so that's what that's the role of the moderator, yeah, right? We, we've had right. this relationship for a long time. Yeah. Um, the, this is a great this is a great question. What does the voucher enrollment look like in Madison? And I didn't bring with me because I didn't think I was going to be part of the presentation. I didn't bring me bring with me the um, the the fiscal bureau January document that has yeah. the enrollment for every school district. So the voucher enrollment in Madison, I think, is very interesting because it is not as high as you would expect just the size of the district. Um, like if you look at Racine's voucher enrollment, it's it's much higher. And I believe that one of the reasons the voucher well, Madison. Yeah, the yeah. one of the reasons that the voucher enrollment in Madison is is not very high. One is that we have a great public school system in the Madison Metropolitan School District. Mm -hmm. Two, the Catholic schools have agreed Don't somehow they don't participate in the voucher program. And it's a diocese, right? Is that what I could? Right. The, Madison, the diocese. Madison diocese does not participate in the voucher program. So they have healthy enrollment and they aren't charging that back to the Madison Metropolitan School District. So thank a Catholic. <laughs> okay, yeah. <clears throat> so these questions all have to do with the academic outcomes. So they're talking about is there data about the performance um, and graduation rate, all of those things. So, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm still having allergy trouble. So you know, yeah, I, no, I'm I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm good, but thank you. But I apologize. It means my voice is going to get scratchy. So. Academic outcomes. Well, those evaluations that I told you about, those evaluations demonstrated that actually those, the kids who participate in the, the voucher program, and what they did was a really, the good research does really careful matching, where they try to um, match a similarly situated child, right? So they try to have kids that are as much alike in in one in the public school, one in the private school to compare them to. So sometimes you hear this called an apples to apples comparison as opposed to apples to oranges. So they're trying to just look. Because if you look at the aggregate, you know, if you look, if you didn't do that, if you just looked at the aggregate, what you'd find both in public schools and in private schools is that performance outcomes are a measure of wealth. That it doesn't matter whether you're in a private school or a public school if if you know, there's more wealth involved, you're, you're, you tend to have higher performance. So the good evaluation programs tried to take that variable away and compare uh, similarly situated kids in each sector. And when they did that, they found that there was virtually, there was no advantage, that there was, it was pretty much a wash, that, you know, in some years the public school kids did better, in some years the private schools did better, but nothing real significant either direction. So, and in fact, we've had some national studies, the more recent studies, well, um, more recent than uh, the evaluation studies that were written into the law originally here. Um, we actually have some pretty large scale studies that show either no difference or actually a negative difference, which is, as Julie could tell you, is a really unusual result to have happen. That's very rare in educational research to have a negative result, but that's what they've actually found in some of these large scale studies in other states. They did not include Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> so kind of commensurate with that, as we've had more and more research that shows that those those original hopes, and I, you know, the as I said, to be fair, People didn't know if this was going to work or not. And, and truth be told, if it had worked, well, yippee, right? If that was really what was going to work, that, yay. But that didn't, that it didn't work. Um, and so now you'll see that those arguments that we need these programs in order to improve academic outcomes, no people who support, who, who make those claims in the state legislature don't make those claims anymore. 
now the the warrant if you will or the argument for the program is is that parents should get to choose so as i say choice choice for its own sake um not whether or not this is going to kind of raise the whole bar for everybody which was milton friedman's idea that if you if the marketplace is at issue the market is going to make all the schools better well that didn't happen so somebody asked is there another way to increase choice for poor kids and families the the argument i think that you have to say is that we actually know what works shocking it's a rigorous curriculum with highly qualified teachers and sufficient resources to implement the curriculum there we go that's that third one right so how could we make things better well frankly we need to make every public school worth choosing. Um, and if you do that, and so if we actually provide the resources necessary for highly qualified teachers to implement a rigorous curriculum, that's how we serve everybody better. And the places that have managed to do that, that's why if you look at, um, again, what I talked about the aggregate, if you, you know, it's not like our wealthy school districts have no kids without means. They do. Those kids do way better than a child without means in a poor district. Resources matter. So that's how you make it better. I'm just making sure. I think I got them all. And can you look at, could you look at this one? Do you know the answer to this one? And then can you talk about that one? And think about that while I answer. <laughs> think about that while I answer. Hmm. How many of these voucher students have been taught rem Oh, you get to do one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's one more here. Oh, it's still on. Um, so this is another one of our mutual rants. Uh, it's <laughs> special education funding. Um, the state, the state formula for because now we're going to go back to special mm -hmm. education and the need to fund schools properly and fund special ed properly. and fund special ed properly. You know, it um, always surprises me that people don't understand people who have votes in the legislature don't seem to understand that it takes more resources to educate children who have greater needs. And all children are not the same. They don't come from the same families. They don't have the same opportunities and experiences before they get to school. And so every child is different. Every child has different needs. And some need some children need more opportunities. They need more resources to move them along to where you want them to be. Right. It's just simple. I mean, and and you know that inherently when you when you work with children. Mm -hmm. um, but for some reason, so special education is expensive. Children have great needs broad array of needs, great needs. And we are, by morals, ethics, um, and lots of other reasons, including federal statute, required to provide children with special education needs. They have to qualify, but special education needs with a free appropriate public education. And the cost is really not an excuse. And some of our children have significant needs, very so in the state of Wisconsin, we have over the years, rather than increasing the pot of money that the legislature allocates as part of the as part of the education budget for special education, we've kept this pot of money the same. It's it's the whole thing about not increasing money in terms of even CPI or a regular ratchet up of a CPI. Oh, oh, we've just kept it the same, no, no increase. 
And so this pot of money keeps getting divided up among all of the more than 400 school districts to children with increasingly expensive special education needs. At one point, the state of Wisconsin reimbursed local school districts 70%, I say it's not even an exaggeration, 70% of the cost to educate a child with special needs. I should mention we are not, I think I might be wrong on this. The last I checked, we were one of only four states that did it this way. That one. does it through what's called a reimbursement approach. Yeah. Other states don't do it that way. Other states provide the money up front, if you will, not as a back end reimbursement. Plan. We're very special in terms of, of, of how we do our school finance in the state of Wisconsin. Oh, we yeah, defy right. all labels. Um, <laughs> so, so this just kept falling, 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 falling until we got below 30%. <laughs> We, I mean, like we got down to 27, 26 percent in 26, 26 percent reimbursement for special education needs. And still people say, well, you know, you you don't want to reimburse it a lot because otherwise you will you will get school districts who create an cre incentive, create an incentive to identify children with special needs. It's like, really, if you're only going to pay 26 cents on every dollar this is not a good business plan. You know, you would go out of business pretty quickly. And so in the last, in the last two budgets, mm -hmm. last, I mean, under, under the current governor's budget proposals, we have in fact increased that percentage of reimbursement for special education. It was supposed to be 30% in the first round, mm -hmm. but it never got up to 30% because there wasn't enough money put into the pot. And this round, we're going up to, are we going up? Are they trying 30 again, or did they go up to 33? I, I, I'm, it's, I don't want to say. It's an, it's an academic, it's kind of a, a hypothetical question anyway, because if they don't put the money in the pot, it won't come up to 30% anyway. Even if they say they're going to, they're going to reimburse 33%. If the money's not there, they don't actually do it. They just, they just give the money away that they have. Except. So. Except if the child is enrolled in a special needs scholarship Oh, yeah. Program, well, if it's, it's a voucher program, you get like all the money you want. If you're there and they actually spend, now, this is a school credit where credit is due that is actually providing special education. And if they can document to the state how much they're providing, that school can get up to 90% of its costs reimbursed. Public school can't, but the private school can't. So we have lots of questions. This is so exciting. <laughs> um, there, so there's a lot of public school folks who just think that's really not fair. That just like you're going to answer those two quickly. I'm going to do this one, one and then the chart. The oh, private the chart oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So how many of these voucher students are being taught remotely, where there is no physical um, bricks and mortar school? I don't actually know the, the, the um, so the voucher programs have to be bricks and mortar school. Some, uh, there, there are rules around how many charter schools can be virtual and they have to actually have an extra layer of uh, approval from the state in order to have any um, virtual charters, although we do have a couple. Um, can you talk more about private charter schools? Well, here I'm going to differ with my good friend. <coughs> I don't call them independent charter schools, private charter schools. Now you could, I know, but you did say that earlier. Um, technically they are not, they are still public schools. Although again, my, <laughs> my good friend that I write with often would say, now Julie, um, my friend Preston Green would say, you know, there's a lot of contention about that right now because these schools often claim to be private for some purposes and public for others. But Right now, at least, all charter schools are a specialized form of public schools. What's different, what's in the independent charter schools, which are um, made available by two provisions in the law. So sometimes you'll hear somebody talk about a 2R charter or a 2X charter. So those charters are charter schools that are not chartered by school districts. 
ones that are chartered by school districts, the school board has to approve and actually the budget for those charter schools is decided by the school board in the same way that the budget for a traditional school is decided by the school board. For the independent charters, like the vouchers, they're guaranteed a, an amount of money per student. Each of those independent charters have been authorized by an entity that's not a school board. So the um, Common Council of the City of Milwaukee can charter a school board. Any university in the state can charter a school board, although UW-Milwaukee was the first one granted that authority and is the really the only one that's done it with, you know, kind of multiple times. Um, <clears throat> you have the, um, there's a special office in UW system that is permit, permitted to uh, authorize schools. And in fact, you have one not far from here, the one city schools is authorized, is a charter school authorized by UW system. Um, and so those independent authorizers and independent meaning not connected to a school board which means that they're at least shielded one more degree probably may more from voters than i mean you know technically yes uw system is a public entity and yes you could uh, use that when you vote for governor who appoints the regents and no, we don't. So, I mean, technically, you know, there's a whole lot of steps between the voter and those people making the decisions is what I'm trying to say. Um, at any rate, those um, independent authorizers with uh, the exception of the two that are um, from our indigenous tribes, who there are two indigenous tribes that have some limited authority to charter schools, all the other independent authorizers can place a school anywhere in the state or authorize a school anywhere in the state and I have no limits to the number of charter schools they can authorize anywhere in the state. Now you've heard us talk about you know the the kind of guaranteed pots of money. Um, so often what you'll hear someone in DPI talk about is the first draw. So they calculate how much money is supposed to go to a school district and then the first draw is they figure out, well, how many kids are enrolled in independent charters? And then they multiply that number by the amount of the independent guaranteed amount, and that gets drawn away, taken away, before it goes to the school district. Then the second draw is they say, okay, how many kids are enrolled in one of our voucher programs, one of our, you know, four voucher programs? And they do the same thing. They multiply that times the voucher, and then that money gets taken away. And then What's left is what gets divided up for all the kids who are left in the public school. So the silly analogy I, I often use is it's like, you know, if you have your, your family and you're, you know, there's four of you and you're sitting, you decided, I don't want to cook tonight, I'm ordering pizza, and they ordered, you ordered pizza. And then some friends showed up. Well, you're going to share your pizza with them because, you know, you're a kind person. But it would be as though they came in the door, but instead of just dividing the pizza in equally among the new number of people who is there, the new person in the door gets a guaranteed slice. And then the, you know, so I, you know, Victor Voucher gets the guaranteed slice, Cindy Charter gets the guaranteed slice, and Penny Public, all the Penny Publics get what get to share what's ever left because they do not get a guaranteed slice. We have a whole bunch of questions about what people can do. So I want to make sure I get to that. Um, I, 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 I'm going to give you, somebody start the clock. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer this question. Why has no one argued separation of church and state? Isn't that a legitimate argument? 30 seconds on the clock, please. They have argued the Supreme Court said it's not an issue. It is a legitimate issue, but the, you know, the five member majority in 2002 said, don't worry about it. Do you know the answer to the question? Uh, so the question is, what is the racial and ethnic composition of the voucher school students? No, I don't. Although the last data that I saw 
suggest that the schools tend to be more racially homogenous than public schools or than the public schools that are near them. And for a, fin for a finale, but I don't know if that's, I haven't seen accurate data in a long time on that. So. Before we go to the what can people do and how can people advocate, because I got a whole stack, I got four of those here. Um, here's a quick one. <laughs> Isn't the desired outcome not just choice, but control? Keep at and keeping children away from difference, difference. from difference, like keeping people in homogenous schools, which is why I put this right after that other one. If most voucher and charter schools are racially homogenous, is that really the purpose? I'm going to recast that a different way. How's that? Um, and here's how I'm going to recast it. If we all agree that as a collective, the people of the state of Wisconsin, we benefit from an educated citizenry. We benefit from having our children educated, right? So we benefit, I, I benefit from the fact that um, Julie's kids are educated. She benefits from the fact that my kids are educated. You know, the, the, person that just fixed my car last week. Thank goodness they knew something about my car because I didn't, you know, so you want, we all benefit from an educated citizenry. So then the, the question is, and if, and because we all recognize that we're willing to collect taxes, to use that money, to pay for the education of children. The real question is what mechanism or system is going to get us better, get us to the point of having some universal level of education. Is it by having money go to private schools and public schools or just private schools or just public schools or you know what's gonna happen? And remember, we started, we started our history lesson in 1954, but we could have gone all the way back to the 1800s, right? Because there was a time when education was considered a private good and each family got to educate their kid in, or not in whatever way they saw fit. And so some people were educated, some people were not. Those that had means, there's that theme again, had private tutors, governesses, right? I, I'm, I'm into those old shows. So, you know, all of that kind of thing used to happen. And then at some point, we as a collective said, gee, that's really not good enough. Let's create a public school system. That happened in the 1830s, really, around the 1830s and beyond. And so, you know, at this point, every state in the union has a constitutional requirement that the state collect funds and provide public education. So my question is, adequately, yes, that's a good one. <laughs> My question is, are what convinces people that having funding two separate sets of schools, one accountable to the public in a way that's vastly different than the other is, is going to get us to our common goal? That's my, that, I don't think we have that answer. And frankly, we haven't had that debate if we, you know, I, I'm still old school enough that I think a good idea can withstand sunshine. So we should be able to have that debate and then vote it up or down either as a, you know, with our state, our representatives, those that we represent us in the legislature or, you know, by ballot measures. Interestingly enough, every time in any state, not, it hasn't happened in our state, but in states that allow ballot measures and they've had ballot measures on vouchers, they have all been voted down. And that's been true for decades. Yeah. So now that we're talking about the legislature, I want to talk about these two after we talk about this one about. So that's we're going to we're we haven't been able to answer all of these questions, but I'm mindful of everyone's time. And I know we need a little time to wrap up. But the next group of these is about politics and advocacy. So that's a good place to go, right? Mm -hmm. And you just involved. you just talked about uh, le the legislature doing things. So um, we've had a couple questions that talks that have 
has talked about how did these programs get actually enacted? Well, budget bills. And we haven't had an up or down vote. But um, in the school finance piece mm -hmm. and in the budget piece, one of the things that we've seen is this connection between redistricting or not redistricting and votes on almost anything, like votes on the culture wars. Um, and it's particularly interesting in school funding because every single one of those legislators represents school districts. And the, the ones that are for, far north, they actually represent more school districts right. because we have, you know, a godzillion of school districts in this state. We have 424 now. Is that this year's count? 420 at least. At least 420 school districts. And so lots of those people who, who, who are elected officials represent even more than one school district. And trying to convince them to listen to their public, to listen to their community, and do right by their community by by bringing more money into their community, by supporting their community's future, by you know, by by thinking about their community's children, mm -hmm. um, has been an incredible uphill battle. And part of that, in my I believe, is because we haven't been able to really hold our legislate legislators accountable for most of their votes votes um many 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 of them are in seats that it wouldn't matter i mean they're they're safe safe seats and so they don't really have to pay attention to their local community um and that's that's the problem i i don't think any of this is going to get fixed by the legislature until until we have fair maps when the League of Women Voters has been doing yeoman's work yeah. on fair maps. I mean, the Absolutely. League of Women Voters has been the leader on fair maps. And, you know, we thank you, thank you, thank you, because none of this public funding, public policy, none of that can be fixed um, until we get until we get fair maps. That's just part of part of a democracy. And, you know, schools are about Public schools are about a democracy as well. Right. Somebody asked about civics. You know, I mean, that is part of what we do mm -hmm. in schools. And we have elected school boards for a reason because they're part of our democratic process. <clears throat> the, I, the one thing that I, I will mention about the funding, that something that may happen, ironically, is as the caps for the statewide program come off, there actually may be more pressure put on legislatures and legislators. And the reason that I say that is that, you know, if you're a private school administrator, you've got a simple math problem. You can figure out how much money you've got. You can figure out your budget. It's pretty simple. Um, the problem for a the public school administrators is this system of choice that we've created in the state means that their budgets are much less predictable. It's really, really, really hard for school districts to really know how much money they're going to get year to year and how to figure out how to be good stewards of that funding. And so I, you know, I, I, that's a, that's a concern. So the, the funding, pro, I mean, the funding problem is, a, is just, yeah, it's a huge it's problem. It's a huge problem. Um, so what can we do besides fair maps? Vote. Um, Vo and vote. voting, vote. voting and voting and voting, and vote. talking to your legislator, talking to your legislature. Um, one of the one of these other questions um, is a small piece, and that is a number of school districts, um, cities and counties um, that have school districts contained within them have now changed their tax bills mm -hmm. to clearly show how much your of your tax money is going to the public school district and how many how much money is going to the private to the voucher and charter schools right and that makes a huge difference because we know that the when you get the tax bill it's like i spend all that money on the madison metropolitan school district N no 
no, that's that's not the way it is. And so if if it's if it's disaggregated like that, it helps people. Yeah. Also, we've had a, bills for a long time trying to make that a requirement yeah, statewide, but, but they doing, haven't doing it by won. county and city is is actually making mm -hmm. some pressure. Yeah. So we have these two other ones, and that those it's gonna these are gonna be our two last. Um, and so it says, how can all parents and grandparents be activated to be advocates for public schools, not just voting? We also, the League of Women Voters does a good job on advocacy in terms of in the legislature about education and, and trying to um, register positions and provide information like this forum. And from Cindy Lindquist, I did not ask you to do this, but thank you very much. Um, it says the Wisconsin Public Education Network, and by the way, Julie, this Julie, and Kevin are all board members of that organization. So we think it's pretty good. Too. So we think it's pretty good, too. Is a, is a way to get involved locally and statewide by keeping up to date with current education issues and legislation. It also offers a chance to be an active advocate. Mm -hmm. So... It's a great organization. It's wisconsinnetwork.org and it's called, and it, the name of it is the Wisconsin Public Education Network, but the website is wisconsinnetwork.org. And you can, you know, you can be involved in however you want to. It's lots of really good information on the website. Really, really good information on or the website. For those people who like to do Facebook rather than the website, there's a lot of good information yeah. through Facebook, but I would never know because that's not something I do. <laughs> um, yeah. The other thing I would say is um, we need to be kind of loud and proud. There's a lot of really fabulous things happening in public schools. And in fact, there's actually been some pretty good research that suggests that there's probably a public school advantage, not a public school disadvantage. And so I think we need to kind of crow about that a little bit. Um, that was a really good book. A few, it's a few years old now. It's um, by Chris Lubiansky, and that's the title, The Public School Advantage. I will warn you, it's very wonky. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of numbers. I, you know. It, so speaking of wonky, oh, we, we better like close it out. out. Yeah, yeah, we better wonk out. Uh, but thank you all for being here online. Thank you for your participation, and thank you for being part of this discussion. Um, and really thank you for your advocacy for public schools. Thank you for your service. We have previous with board Madison members. board members. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your service to public schools. Um, and it's been great, right? Yes, thank We've you. Thank it. you for having us here.